Good morning, church, and welcome to Poplar Springs, a Christian church that's developing disciples. My name is Doug, and I have some incredible, world-changing news for you this morning. Some 2,000 years ago today, there was a four-day event that changed the world forever. On a Thursday night, Jesus met with these disciples in the upper room, and there established the Last Supper and the First Communion. On Friday, He was convicted, tried, and crucified for being the Son of God. On Saturday, He was dead in the tomb, but His disciples were worried. They were scared because they didn't know what was going to happen to them with their leader gone. But here's that good news I was telling you about. On Sunday morning, before the sun even rose, Mary Magdalene was there at the tomb to finish taking care of the body. But she found out he was gone. The tomb was empty, and he was alive. And that is the good news I wanted you to know today. And now for the announcements. First, we'll be starting up Life Change University on Wednesday, April the 10th at 6.30 p.m. We offer three classes. The first class is a ladies' Bible study. The second is PS 101. And the third is when God's people pray. Don't miss this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God, with your brothers and sisters in Christ here at Poplar Springs. Next, we'll have a date night on Saturday, May 4th from 6 to 8 p.m. We invite all couples to come for a time of fellowship. Finally, is our next compass meeting. It's on Sunday, April 21st at 6.15 p.m. I'd like to share just a couple of scriptures as we celebrate this Easter Sunday. We learn in Matthew 28, 5 and 6, the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as He said He would. And John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May you enjoy your worship time with us here at Poplar Springs this morning. Walks with me. 
and talks with me along life's narrow way. Separated, the breach was far too wide. 
But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious Yes. Sing it with us. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, and then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. That's right. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, yes. Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved. Amen. If you would, as we have worshipped our risen King through song, prepare to worship Him through our giving. You pray with me of how God would have you with open hands and generous hearts to give back to Him through all that He's done for us. Amen. Pray with me. Father, You are a great and awesome, mighty, gracious God. God, You made a provision for us, when we didn't deserve anything, you sent Jesus Christ to this earth to live a sinless life and be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And you shed his blood on the cross. But God, you didn't leave him there. Three days later, you raised him from the dead so that we could be reconciled back into a relationship with you. God, we thank you 
so much for that provision of salvation. God, we also thank you for providing for our needs. And so, God, as we have worshipped you through song, and now as we worship you through our giving, Father, I pray that we would give back what you deserve. And, God, I pray that you'd give us wisdom to use the resources that you have supplied us to advance the gospel where we live, work, and play, to advance the gospel around the world so that other people could experience the joy that we are full of this morning. So God, have your way in us, and may Christ be exalted in all that we do. In his precious name we pray, amen. And it's so good to see each of you today. Glad that you are here. And I'm going to invite everybody here to join with me in a matter of prayer. And here's the prayer request that I have for you. Pray that the chairs that we have ordered upstairs will get here before June. Bless the Lord. We're going to need them. Amen. We're going to need them.
And so uh, it's uh, coming along and uh, we'll hopefully maybe even next week we'll show you some pictures of all the progress that's happening upstairs. And so the, the, the thing that's going to take the longest to get here was the chairs themselves. And so I'm just praying that God somehow, some way, not that I want to take from anybody else. Okay. Well... Maybe a little, all right? Maybe, maybe just a little. But I mean, I want to get him here, and I want to be able to, to be back up. But so, church, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your understanding. And uh, even today, I know it's, uh, it's a little crowded, and I thank God that it is crowded. And uh, I just thank you for your patience. If you have a copy of God's Word, or you got your phone, device, whatever you want to use, I'm going to encourage you to look with me in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I... Um, Thank our staff for just leading Thursday evening and uh, about, uh, I don't know, sometime Wednesday, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe about 8 or 9 o'clock Wednesday night, I started getting a little headache. By 3 o'clock uh, early Wednesday morning, uh, man, I was just not feeling good. And so whatever that thing that has been going around, it nabbed me, all right? And uh, But I'm grateful for our guys just stepping in. Brian, thank you so much, friend, for just leading and leading so well. Scott, thank you so much. And so I don't ever have to worry about things. God's given us some great pastors and great leaders, and, uh, and I'm just grateful that we are on the same team. I know that Brian left off in John chapter 13. So if you just know that that chapter, here's Jesus calling his disciples up to the upper room. And in that upper room experience, he's beginning to model them this life of humility this life of passion. And, and so he literally demonstrates the gospel that Jesus came. And the Bible says that he, he got up, he took off his outer garment, right? So just because Jesus came, he didn't cease to be God. But as Jesus came, he did come as a man. You understand that, right? And so he was very God, but yet he was man. And as a man, he came to serve. He came with the purpose, and the purpose was to be obedient to the Father. And then he began to wash his disciples' feet. And so the imagery is that he came down, he became man as man. He, di he died as only a man could do for the sins of man. And then the Bible says he got back up and sat down. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So he came, he lived, he died. He resurrected, he assembled, uh, ascended up to heaven. He sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so this day we call Easter. I, I just I have a question. What difference does the resurrection make? Now, there was a great spirit of joy in this room today. Did you feel it? I'm telling you, praise the Lord for it. What difference does the resurrection make? Well, John chapter 20, I'm going to use these few verses to try to answer that question. Listen to these words. John chapter 20, I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to come, not just because it's Easter, but Lord, every day, is a good day to think about the resurrection. And Lord, every Sunday being the first day of the week is the greatest time that we can just come together and gather together as a body. Lord, to worship you, to praise you, to sing praises to your glorious name. And so Lord, I believe that you have a word for each of us today. And so Lord, you know that my prayer has been that Father, you would just do a work that only you can do. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come and to be our teacher. 
that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would let us see the truth of this text. Lord, I want you to speak today. And God, as you speak, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would obey. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 19, the Bible makes it pretty clear that the risen Savior brings peace to our fears. I think that's one difference that the resurrection makes, that he brings peace to our fears. The Bible says in verse 19, on the evening of that day, what day? It was Sunday. It was the day of the resurrection. It was evening time of the first day of the week. And the Bible says the doors were locked and the disciples were there for the fear of the Jews. And so here were the disciples in the upper room, the exact same upper room that they were in in John chapter 13. And now they were there and they were frightened. They were scared to death. The Bible says that the doors were locked for the fear of the Jews. Here's what I know about fear. You can lock the door, but you can't keep fear out. Somebody say amen. Can't do it. Matter of fact, Luke's account of the same thing that says that when Jesus came, that it scared them to death. Now, let's just be honest. Has anybody ever snuck up on you? They were not there, and then all of a sudden they were there? Pat does that a few times to me. And I don't know why I jump like I do, but I do. And, and, she, and so we give each other a hard time. I, I'll say, do not sneak up on me. So I think these guys were scared because they were fearing the Jews. But I also think there was a fear because all of a sudden, here is Jesus. He was not there, and all of a sudden, he was there. Here he is in his glorified body. Here he is in all of his glory and all of his majesty. And one of my favorite preachers used this phrase. He said they were scared spitless. That's pretty scared if you ask me, all right? And so they were gripped with this fear. And, and Luke's account says that they were startled. They were frightened. They were troubled in their spirit. They doubted. They thought that what they were seeing was a ghost. As a matter of fact, that's where we get our English word phobia from. Phobos. They thought that it was a ghost. And so Jesus spoke to them. And he spoke words of peace. The Bible says that he showed them his scars. The very one that hung upon the cross. You can imagine the scars here and the scars in his side. He begins to show them the scars. So he speaks his word of peace. He shows them that he is the risen Savior. He spoke peace. He showed the proof of his scars, which is of utmost importance. We do serve a risen Savior. The Bible says in Romans 4, 4 and 25, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus who was delivered for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So if Jesus had not resurrected from the dead, you understand that God's plan would have failed. A dead Savior is not a Savior at all. He's not a Savior at all. But for those of us who believe, we know that the resurrection is sure. We know that the resurrection is real. It is a reality. We serve a risen Savior. We do not serve a dead deity. And so this same Jesus said, peace. You know, when you're afraid, all you need is some peace. And he spoke his peace. He's the only one where, where true peace can be found. You, you can't go to Walmart and get it. You get it through the person of Jesus, and he makes peace possible. Jesus knew that they were scared. He knew that, that his peace is exactly what they needed. He did not give them condemnation. He gave them peace. Church, I want you to hear me. Jesus may never remove the trial or difficulty that you are facing right now, and our fears can be real at times. But we can have peace in the midst of those experiences. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. No promise of a life without trial. No promise of a life without difficulty. But he did promise his peace. John 16, 33, I've said these things to you. That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. 
I have overcome the world. There's a promise there, a promise of peace and a promise of assurance. So what are you facing today? What fear has gripped you? What door have you locked because you are afraid, you are troubled, you are disturbed? I promise you this, the same locked door that could not keep fear out is the same locked door that could not keep Jesus out. And so he came to bring his peace and to bring his assurance to his disciples. You know why they were afraid? They were afraid because earlier in John 16, Jesus said, this world hates you. They hated me. They're going to hate you. And they may even kill you and think they are doing God's work. But peace, peace, I have overcome the world. I love what Paul said to the church at Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What difference does the resurrection make? The risen Savior can bring peace where there is fear. Second thing I want you to see is this. The risen Savior calls us to a great purpose. I love the progression. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw it was the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you, you got to get this down big and plain. Jesus was sent. He was sent on a mission from the Father to rescue us. And maybe you're here today and say, well, Kim, why, why did God have to send Jesus? Well, God created Adam in the Garden of Eden. God had put him in a perfect place at a perfect time and everything was perfect and and God gave him instruction and all he had to do to experience life and peace was just to follow God's instruction. But Adam disobeyed. He broke God's law. He broke God's instruction. And the moment that he did, life changed to death. And now man, because of the first Adam, we are sinners by nature and by choice. And what we deserve is God's holy wrath. And so what Adam was going to have to endure was the judgment of God. And so, and so God, through his son Jesus, worked in such a way that Jesus would be our wrath absorber. I love the way that 1 Peter chapter 2 talks about this. Just let's indulge me for just a moment. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live unto righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. That is why Jesus was sent. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again in order that you and I could know his pardon, his forgiveness, that you and I could be reconciled to God. And Jesus said, I've been sent and now I am sending you. It's a commission. Some of you may know Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. I think that's why Jesus said the second time, peace be with you. I think that peace is related to sending and to serving. You see, as a disciple of Jesus, God is calling us to join him in his redemptive work. As a follower of Jesus, I'm going to continually be changed. As a disciple of Jesus, I'm going to embrace the Lord's mission as my very own. And by not doing so, guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to experience his peace. I'm not going to experience his joy. And I cannot be glad like the disciples. I think that's why some Christians look like they've been baptized in dill pickle juice. They make the abundant life seem like such a horrible life that is such a drudgery serving the Lord. Listen, I think there is something there for the church to wrap your heart around. I am convinced of this. If you are not serving, there is not going to be peace. If you're not serving, I don't think there's going to be any joy. The Bible says we got to go. You can't spell the gospel without go because we have been sent. We just can't stick some sign out front and say, come on in, you lucky sinners, and get saved. It doesn't work like that. We've got to unlock the doors. We've got to get out there. Jesus made it clear it's not going to be easy, but it is what he called us to do. That's why he prayed for us in John chapter 17. Oh, my soul. He said, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them in the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only. And I think he's talking about the disciples that were there right then. But also for those who will believe, I think that's me and you. Those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as the Father and I are one, and I and you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Sent. Sent. The gospel makes a difference because God has called us to a great purpose. Number three, God raised Jesus from the dead because it provides us with supernatural power. Peace be with you as the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Say, Ken, why is that passage important? Here, church, you got to hear this. The reason that is so significant and true is because we live by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you understand that? The same resurrection power that got Jesus out of that tomb is the same resurrection power that lives in us. Romans 6, 4 says, we are buried therefore by him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. God will breathe on us to give us the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know that's coming in Acts. But Jesus is giving them a preview because here's the deal. He he, he had already said in John 15, for without me, you can do nothing. And so he is empowering them. He is gifting them. He is supernaturally breathing the Holy Spirit upon them so they can do and fulfill the purpose that they had been called to do. You know, one of the most misused verses in all of the Bible is Philippians 4.13. Can you believe that? Some of you may know that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm going to tell you what it doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that it gives you the ability to score a touchdown. That does not give you the power or the ability to hit a grand slam home run. Even though the Yankees are undefeated. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I'm amazed at how we take that verse of Scripture completely out of context. Do you know what it's being? Do you understand the context of Philippians 4.13 is this? It's all about the gospel. 
That God is saying, I am going to give you supernatural power that not only that you can believe the gospel, but you can live the gospel. It is my life being lived in and through you. That is the power of God unto salvation. So he is saying, I'm going to give you the supernatural power to be the church that I died for you to be. Power. Why is the resurrection important? What difference does it make? Friend, according to 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is still dead and in the tomb, my preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. We have no hope. We have no supernatural power to claim. But I got good news. He is not dead, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He is risen and he is alive forevermore. I love the fact that Jesus said, I have the power to lay my life down, but I have the power to take it up again. Amen? No man takes my life. I lay it down. We've been commissioned, empowered, not through our flesh, but by the Holy Spirit of God. I know I'm, I'm, I'm referencing a lot in John, so you can tell where I've been in my quiet time. So in John chapter 3, and I appreciate Doug using John 3, 16. You, you know, when, when that verse was being used, you know Jesus was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus had a pretty important question because he's trying to figure out how in the world is somebody going to be born again? And here, Jesus said something rather interesting. He said, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think this, the, 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 the Bible would indicate that, you know, the wind is a lot like the Holy Spirit. You don't necessarily see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. You don't necessarily see the Holy Spirit move, but you know that the Holy Spirit is moving because you see the effect of the Holy Spirit moving. And I think what Jesus is doing here and what Jesus is doing now, listen, He is preparing us for greater things and greater experiences for the sake of the gospel and for God's glory. That's why the resurrection makes a difference. Last thing. The Savior gives us a message to proclaim. Now, the hardest part of this whole message is verse 23. If you forgive sin of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Let me tell you what that is not saying. That is not saying that your pastor has the power to forgive sin. That is not saying that a Catholic priest has the power to forgive sin. I can't, you know, boom, I can't do that, right? And I'm not trying to make fun. When the priest does this, you know, he kind of does this, right? He does, th he does this, and then he does this. Y'all know what that really means? Should I? Oh, my wife just called me down. Oh, my wife just called me down. I'll tell you what, then after church, I'll tell you, all right? After church, I'll tell you. So what it does not mean, it does not mean that man has the power to forgive. Listen closely. What that passage is saying is God has already made things new. God has already made forgiveness possible. Forgiveness is already ours. And when you receive what God has already done, you will be forgiven. But if you don't receive what God has done, you won't be forgiven. Now the word forgive there is the one most important word in verse 23. It means to be sent. It means to be carried off. So you got to go back to Leviticus chapter 16 to kind of really understand the full measure of that word. It was a picture of the high priest in the Old Testament. 
on the day of atonement, that one day in the calendar year of Israel, the high priest would do all the things that the high priest would need to do in order that he would sacrifice an animal for the sins of Israel and then confess those sins to the Lord on behalf of the nation. Here's how he would do that. He would take two sacrificial animals. We call one of those the scapegoat. So, so we know that he takes these two goats, and on that one goat he kills, he sacrifices it on the altar. He takes the blood and sprinkles it on the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Because God demands a blood sacrifice to atone and to reconcile from sin. And then he would take his hands and lay his hands, those bloody hands, on top of the other goat. Say, Ken, how did they determine which one? The Bible says that he would cast lots. And as he cast lots, this one became the sacrifice, this one became the scapegoat. And so the sacrifice was to atone and pay the penalty. But then he would take his hands, lay it on the head of the scapegoat. He would confess the sins of Israel. And then they would take that goat out in the wilderness. It was a picture that through the blood, the sins had been removed and taken away. And they did that year after year after year. But Jesus came. The Bible says he was the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus came and did what those sacrifice. Listen, you, we don't have to have sacrifices anymore. We don't have scapegoats anymore. You know why? Because the one who knew no sin, did no sin, had no sin. The Bible says became sin for us. Colossians 2 says he took our sin to the cross. He nailed it to his cross. And I love this. He says he canceled out the debt of our sin. Any of y'all like getting free stuff? I've seen 80-year-old women knock somebody down to get something free. (laughs) Go to Walmart. One o'clock in the morning, I dare you. It's a show is what it is. I mean, that, that's, that, that's it. You can you see all kind of stuff. It's like going to the circus. You can see bearded women. You, you can just, anyway, okay, I'm sorry. I'm digressing. <laughs> and people can, people can just have no life in them whatsoever. Just, just like, like the walking dead. You know what I'm talking about? Just like the walking dead. And then all of a sudden you say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss something free. They would knock you down to get something free. To be honest with you, all of us like something free. And you know what God did? God made it possible that forgiveness could be free because it was his son that provided the sacrifice and the atonement. We have been reconciled to God. Not we're going to be. The Bible says it's already happened. It's done. The issue is are you going to agree with what God has done. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Canceled, the debt has been paid. That is the message that we get to declare. That is the message that we get to proclaim. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus has done. It is finished. It is complete. Sin is forgiven. That is the message of the church. That's why we can believe and confess Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like wool. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become white as snow. Oh, my soul. Let me give you one more. Let me just, 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 I know, I know, I know. Oh, John 6 again. Because I believe this actually interprets for us that passage. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 
But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. You know, the good thing about Jesus getting up from the grave is the fact that because he is alive, we are going to be alive forever. So if I drop dead this afternoon, don't you dare believe it. If you get the Spartanburg Herald Journal and the obit says, Pastor Ken Forrester, married to Pat, died. Don't believe it. I'm asleep. (laughs) Do you know, not long ago, I had one of these cemeteries call me. I mean, not cemetery. You know, I guess it is cemetery. You know, uh, I won't call the name of it. No, it wasn't a funeral home. The cemetery, right? And they kept wanting us to buy plots. Well, we've already got a couple of plots. They just kept calling. I was getting tired of it. And finally, the guy said, don't you want a good deal? I said, I tell you what, here's, let's do this. I don't want to buy the plots. I just want to rent them. Because the truth is, I'm not going to need them forever, right? I'm not going to need those things forever. Matter of fact, there's going to come a day out here. There is going to be some more mess out here. Because the Bible says everybody who's died in Christ, guess what? When the Lord comes, the church is going to be raptured. And guess what? There's some folks out there. Boom. Those bodies are going to be joined together in the air. and We're going to meet up there. Because he's alive, I'm alive. Amen. It's his power. So, so one more thing real quick. This is, this, is, this is not in your bulletin. Imagine that. I'm going to preach something that's not in the book. If you really want to be able to answer the question, why is the resurrection important? I'll tell you why. It's important because of a young girl named Charlie Foster, who not long ago was convicted of her sin went to Jesus, and according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, she believed, she confessed, and the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? That's why the resurrection is important. So are you ready? All right, you come on. Dale, this is Dad Dale. This is Charlie And uh, uh, she is one of my favorite people because almost every Sunday she draws me something and I still have every one of those things in my Bible, all right? So y'all can come around here. You can use the steps. Amen. Amen. Charlie, you know that you're trusting Jesus today, right? Amen. You believe you believe God at his word, that as you trusted him, that he saved you and changed you and made you a brand new person in him. And today you're not ashamed and we're gonna we're just gonna follow through in believers baptism. So Dad, Dale, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. So Charlie, upon your profession of faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your dad is going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, raised with Christ in the likeness of his glorious resurrection. Amen. That's that's why the resurrection matters. That's why the resurrection is important. What about you? Have you ever come to a place in your life that you knew for certain that you had eternal life? 
You know, sometimes I give a public invitation, sometimes I don't, but today I just feel overwhelmed that I need to give a public invitation. And I'm going to ask Scott to come. Zane, wherever Zane is, I just want Zane to come to the piano. So, Scott, I want you, to, I want you down here, bud. I want you down here. Brian, I want you to come down here. Is Joey, Joey, I want you to come. Chris is, uh, you, you, you probably can't, all right? So you just, keep, you just keep doing, but three of our pastors are here, and I'm going to be here. In just a moment, I'm going to get Zane just to begin playing something, and, and here's just the bottom line. It is, I am convinced that in a room of hundreds of people, that there are those here who have never been forgiven. Yet, God's made it possible that you could be forgiven. The, the, verse 23 says, if, if you just agree with what God has done and you confess your sin and turn yourself over to Him, that God would save you and redeem you and reconcile you. But if you don't, then you can't be forgiven. You can't be reconciled. I don't want anybody here not to be reconciled with God. So in just a moment, we're going to just pray, and these guys are going to be here. And if you're here today, listen, if you're here today and you don't know for absolute, with absolute certainty that, that you have been forgiven, and that you have trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm going to ask you to come and take one of these guys by the hand and let them lead you to faith in Christ. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you've got a fear. And maybe your greatest fear is letting go and trusting in God's forgiveness. My prayer is God would unlock that door and birth you into his forever family. So, Lord, we come to you today. We ask, God, that you just continue speaking and drawing people to yourself. Lord, I believe there are many that need to follow the example of Jesus, follow the example of Charlie. That, God, we know that you paid a price that we couldn't pay. And that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, Jesus, that you've been raised from the dead. God, if we confess our sin to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us, God. Lord, we pray that you would bring many sons to glory, many daughters to glory, even today. We pray this in your name. I'm just going to ask you to stand, Brother Zane. You just begin playing whatever you want to play. And if, if, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about your relationship with Christ, I want you to just be brave enough and courageous enough just to step out and come and take one of these pastors by the hand. Anybody at all. Trust Him. Trust Him. Thank you for who you are and thank you for this moment. And Lord, I believe that you are speaking. And so, Lord, we're just not going to manipulate today. We're not going to guilt today. But Lord, we will make ourselves available. 
And so, Lord, I pray that even after we're dismissed, if someone, God, just needs to talk to someone today, God, they'd seek us out and just be able to have a conversation. Just like Jesus had a conversation with people in Mark chapter 2. And so, Lord, we, we commit this into your hands. We know that your word says that your word does not return void. So, God, we believe that you're going to save. We believe that you're going to redeem. We believe, God, all those things. And so, God, we keep praying for it. We keep trusting you for it. God, we know that your timing is perfect. And so, God, continue to create in us the desire to be faithful, to share truth and to share the gospel. And, God, we will leave all the results up to you. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm so glad that all of you are here today. Listen, hope you enjoy family time today. But if you need some help, listen, we're going to hang around. We'll be here. God bless you. You're dismissed.